Psalms 51. This is a psalm of David. We'll begin reading verse number 1. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Let's again pray. Father, thank you for the good singing. Thank you for those children. Lord, we're thankful for their heritage of the Lord and their blessing. Lord, thank you for being a great God. Thank you for allowing us this day to assemble and once again look into the perfect law of liberty. Now, Father, I pray that you'd put a hedge about us. I pray that you'd arrest our hearts and our attention. I pray for those that may be in our attendance today unsaved. I pray that the weight of the Holy Ghost of God would be upon them like David just said, that his bones had been broken. I pray that the weight would crush every thought of pride and everything that they cling to and hold to that keeps them from getting saved. I pray for the saints of God that, Lord, we would realize that, Lord, we can be renewed and have a right spirit. We can be clean in your eyes. And, God, we can live an abundant life. Now, God, I pray that, Lord, uh, you would certainly get glory and honor. Use this unworthy vessel. Help us this day to do business with God. And we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of God we do pray. Amen and amen. In this psalm, we find that David calls for God's mercy. I'm glad that God is a merciful God. In verse number one, he says, have mercy upon me. I've got good news today that the great God of glory looks and longs to have mercy upon you and I. Amen. He says, O oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Uh, I've got good news. Uh, God is a God who is full of tender mercy. Uh, he's full of loving kindness. Uh, he looks to us in kindness and love. Uh, he looks to us with forgiveness. Uh, he looks to us longing to make us clean in his sight. Uh, we see David cries for God's mercy in verse 1. In verses 2 through 4, he confesses his sin. Can I say... It's not enough to know that we fail God. We must confess our sin before God. Right. Mm, can I say in this psalm, David mentions his sin five times. But he goes on to refer his failing God ten times. It's weighing upon him. Yeah. Matter of fact, he said, my sin is ever before me. David could find no rejoicing because everywhere he looked, he saw his failings before God. Uh, what's wrong in our day and age is we live in a day and age where man is right in his own eyes. We can justify everything and we have a label for everything. We've tried to soften the blow of sin. Used to people were called drunks, now they're called alcoholics. 
Used to, people were addicted to things. Now they have a disease. Used to, uh, 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 people were called sinners. Now they're called just having a good time and enjoying life. I even heard yesterday, this is how we try to soften things in America. In America, we've become so soft. Uh, I heard yesterday that Hamilton County has changed the name of their welfare program because welfare is degrading to people. Now they just call it JFS for Jobs and Family Services. They don't want anybody to feel intimidated anymore. And we've tried to lessen the blow of everything. By the way, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Sure. It's one thing if somebody needs some help, and it's one thing if somebody needs a stopgap. Welfare was never intended to be a lifestyle, but yet it's become that in America because people don't want to work. Hmm? You know what the Bible says about a man that won't provide for his family? The Bible says he's worse than an infidel. Hmm? Uh, but we don't want to call sin, sin anymore. They don't do it in pulpits anymore. Uh, preachers won't name sin, won't call people uh, out, won't let people know that uh, when you sin, you are sinning against God Almighty and God's taking a note. And so David confesses his sin before God. He calls for God's mercy. He confesses his sin. In verses 7 through 12, he cries for cleansing. Mm, friend, if you've ever been clean before God... And you step your foot in a mud puddle, you long to get clean again. Mm. Now listen. Uh, the bar, as I mentioned earlier, has been moved in religion. It's been moved in preaching. The bar's never been moved in the Bible. It's never been moved in heaven. But people today don't know what sin is. Can I say a, a real definition of sin is breaking God's law. See, when you sin, you sin against God personally. It's defined as missing the mark of moral purity. Boy, I've got to put both hands up, do you? I've missed the mark sometimes. Huh? It's defined as falling short of God's righteousness. Do you know why God gave the law for us to see what was holy in God's, in God's sight? Do you know why God sent His Son to die for our sin? Because we could never be righteous in ourselves. Because David said it in this psalm, we were conceived in iniquity and in sin were we brought forth. We were sinners by birth. We're sinners by nature. And too many times we're sinners by practice. The Bible defines sin this way in James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I wonder how many Baptist sinners there are this morning decided to sleep in. When the Bible commands us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Hmm. One of my favorite writers, Oswald Chambers, said this. The essence of sin is the refusal to recognize that we are accountable to God at all. Yes, sir. Now, you may think that what you do is hidden. You may think what you do doesn't affect anybody. You may think that nobody cares. But I'm telling you, God's keeping a record sure. of our lives. And you will give an account of yourself to Almighty God. Well, I want to preach on this thought for just a few minutes this morning so you can go home and take a nap. In the wake of the media scare of the now coronavirus, let me just say this. Do you realize that there's greater odds for something falling from the space station and hitting you and killing you than you to get coronavirus? Now, I'm not saying to live haphazardly, but I'm saying don't live in fear. The way you attack coronavirus is the same way you attack the flu or anything else. Wash your hands with hot, soapy water uh, after you've shaken hands and things with people. Uh, uh, use some hand sanitizer. Just be sensible. But listen, we come in contact with things every day that could kill us. It's only by the grace of God we're even breathing. Are you realizing that? I refuse to live my life in fear. 
Hmm? Uh, you know, most of the stuff you eat will kill you. Uh, so why are you worried about coronavirus? If you're that scared about it, get you some Lysol and use it as mouthwash or something. Uh, you'll be all right. But in lieu of everybody being scared to death of the impending doom, we used to talk about it in my Sunday school. You remember the killer bees? They was going to wipe us out. And then we had Zika and Freaka and Jika and swine flu, bird flu, chicken coop flu, uh, one flew over the cuckoo nest flu. I mean, every year, year it's something. Why don't we wake up next year to be some other virus, huh? Just trying to help you. Why live in fear? Amen. They're about as right on that stuff as the weatherman is. Are you listening? Sure. Uh, and Lou, all these things going to kill us. We're still here. But in lieu of the impending doom, I want to really preach on this. Mankind's universal epidemic. What I'm going to preach on affects everybody everywhere. And it is an epidemic. It's called sin. Hmm? Can I say the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The chances of anybody in this uh, 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 sanctuary this morning getting coronavirus are very slim, but the chances of everybody in this building uh, 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 committing sin is 100%. Amen. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says there's none righteous. Uh, one of the definitions of sin is falling short of God's righteousness. Uh, uh, can I say sin gets 100% of everybody? Hmm? Now let me give you some things about this epidemic called sin. This epidemic is realized in lives when they are enticed to sin. Enticement causes us to sin. James 1 says this in verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Uh, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Uh, you know why there's funerals in this world? You know why there's graveyards? Uh, you know why Brother Eric's in the casket business? Uh, because we're all going to die. Uh, because, my dear friends, sin came to this world, uh, and when sin came, death followed it. Uh, can I say, we are enticed to sin. Everybody has a push button. You've seen uh, Staples got the easy button. Or Office Depot. Staples, boo, Office Depot's got the easy button. You got an easy button too. Right. And the devil just hits it just right. Or your flesh gets uh, caught up uh, and a whiff of it just right. You'll be enticed Amen. to sin. Yep. Hmm? I confess every time I see a truck carrying a load of Corvettes, I got to pull off and repent. Y'all think I'm kidding. I love them things. Can I tell this? It's a sober day. I got to tell this. Brother Doug, Miss Sheila come in her Cam Camaro this morning. I was in my office. I stayed in there and watched on the camera to see how he got out of the thing. Huh? It's a convertible. I thought he was going to have to lower the top. Get out. He's a big man in a little car. I thought, And I'm thinking, bless God, if he can get out of a Camaro, I could get out of a Corvette. Hallelujah! <laughs> can I say we are enticed to sin? Genesis chapter 3, we find the first enticement of sin. And in verse number 4, the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Well, God said they would. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The epidemic of sin starts in your life and my life with enticement. We're enticed to sin. Could I say this epidemic is realized in the execution of sin? In Genesis 2.15, this is what God told Adam. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There was God's command. There was God's word. There was God's law. You can eat of everything in this garden. Everything is good for you. Everything is freely yours except that one tree. Hmm? It's kind of like Christmas time. You'll mortgage your house to buy little Johnny and little Susie every little special toy that's on the market. And then you get all that expense, and there it is, the splendor of Christmas. And they go play with the box. God said, here is all of paradise. Just stay away from that one tree. That was the law of God. But the story didn't end there. In Genesis 3, 6, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Yeah. Hmm. Can I say something? God told him not to. The devil enticed her. And then the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of, the life, the pride of life kicked in. She looked at it. Well, it does look like it's good fruit. Yeah. Well, and if it's going to make me wise and be like God, that's a good thing. So I'll just take it and eat it. Then she gave to her husband. Without hesitating, he took it and ate it. Notice some things. The devil only enticed the woman but it affected everybody in the garden it even affected the garden because after sin came then came the curse of sin no rose ever had a thorn until sin came there was no sickness no disease there was no coronavirus in the garden until sin came see her Actions had grave consequences that she didn't count on. And neither do we. There is the execution of sin. You say, well, if the devil enticed her, why did he take of it, partake of it? Well, you see, if you go study, God made him. Then he named everything that was named. He named all the vegetation. He named all the animal kingdom. You see, before sin, man had a mind like God. It wasn't tainted. And he uh, named everything. And I don't know how long it took him, Brother Mike, to name everything and to live. But I don't know how long he lived, but he lived a while. And then God put him asleep, took out a rib, and made woman. Mary, he knew life without her, and he knew life with her. And when she became tainted by sin, he couldn't imagine living without her again. And so he took. There's been many people tripped up in sin because of their care for somebody else. Hmm. We see this epidemic is realized in the enticement to sin, the execution of sin, but also I want you to notice it's realized in the effects of sin, the consequences. In Genesis 6, we find verse number 5, just a few chapters later in the Bible. The Bible says, And God saw the, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The effects of sin ran through this world to where every man's thought was only evil continually. It was so bad, Brother Phil, that God, it grieved him that he even made man. That was then. I wonder what he thinks of now. Hmm? You see, there is a consequence. There's effects of sin. Can I say sin will leave the body racked with pain and diseased? The billboards always paint a pretty picture of folks having a good time and partying. Hmm? Oh, they're always on a beach scene in the commercial and everything's wonderful. They never sow the end result of sin, do they? 
Mm -mm. They never show somebody uh, uh, gasping for their last breath mm, because emphysema has eaten their lungs away because they smoked for 60 years. They just showed them the Marlboro Man riding a horse, having a good time. Mm. I did a funeral last week. It was an amazing thing. This lady kept going in and out and in and out. I knew what she's doing. She was going out there getting her cancer sticks. That's what she called them. And listen, about the third time she went out, she says, uh, she said, I was an alcoholic for 40 years. She said, and I was able to kick booze. She said, but these cancer sticks, I can't give them up. She said, I hope I went. She said, I'm 63 years old. I hope I can. Now, when she said 63, something stopped in me. That's not much older than me. But if you saw that woman, she looked like she was 25 years older than me. I'm not looking real good, but compared to her, hey, I'm George Clooney. Huh? I'm telling you, sin pays a, a, a great price and takes a great toll on your body, friend. Uh, oh, God can forgive you of sin. God can cleanse you from sin. But there is still the scars uh, of sin. It'll leave a body racked with pain and disease. Uh, uh, sin will leave the beauty of innocence destitute and destroyed. Uh, sin will leave the blessing of family divided and disarray. I've seen family members who won't even talk to their uh, uh, one another because somebody got mama's brooch at the funeral, huh? Can I say this? Uh, uh, sin will bank, uh, uh, leave the bank account drained of all funds. Uh, sin will take the beacon of hopes and dreams and leave them in ruin and despair. Uh, uh, sin will leave the bulwarks of society lying in moral decay. And that's where we are today. Amen. There are effects to sin. Can I say this epidemic is realized in the excuses of sin? In Genesis 3.12... After um, Adam and Eve realized they sinned, they realized that immediately they started trying to cover their nakedness. And can I say, it's amazing today how, what, what great lengths people will go to to try and cover their sin. When they had to confront God, this is what Adam said. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. In Psalm 51, David he does business with God about his sin. In Genesis 3, Adam is offering excuses for his sin. He said, God, you made that woman. And that woman took, she gave it to me and I did eat. It's all the woman's fault. Yeah. Wait a second. Those last three words are, I did eat. Hmm? People are all the time trying to make excuses for their sin. Yeah. Hmm? Well, it's the way I was raised. Well, I understand. The way you were raised has a great impact on you, and it will for the rest of your life. Yeah. But when you're confronted with the Bible and with God, then you're accountable to God. Amen. People will make excuses. Well, preacher, you just don't know. No, I don't. But when you make excuses, the bottom line is you just need to own it. Yeah. Guilty. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? Adam didn't. He's blaming Eve. Eve's probably over there broken hearted. Not him. He's full of pride. That woman. That woman. That woman. Can I say this epidemic of sin is realized in those that seek entitlement in lieu of their sin. We live in a day and age where people sin and they glory in it. Amen. They expect you to be okay with it. They expect special privileges because they're sinners. That's nothing new, by the way. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, the Bible says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Amen. How'd that end up? Well, verse 28 says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Sounds like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? Huh? 
without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They seek entitlements in lieu of their sin. They boast in their sin. They parade their sin. Bless God, you can't turn on the TV without seeing it on every commercial and in every show. And we're supposed to just take it. Because, bless God, they're sinners and they're bold enough to proclaim it. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what God says. You are too narrow-minded. And then they live however they want to. Yep. Amen. Can I help you something? They're free to do that. Sure. But when they face God, they'll wish they hadn't. Good. Amen. Can I say this in lieu of this epidemic called sin? God demands that we express or acknowledge our sin. Amen. And that's what David does in this psalm. Can I say God wants us to recognize our sin. In verse number 3, David says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. No one will ever get forgiven till they admit they're sinful. No one will ever get born again until they admit they're lost in sin and they need to be saved from their sin. God expects us to acknowledge, acknowledge that we're sinful and that we need Him to have mercy on us. Can I say He not only wants us to recognize our sin, because some people will admit, I'm, I'm, I need to get saved. I'm sinful. That's a good step, but that's not what it takes. That's not the completion. That's the first step. God expects us to repent of our sin. Verse number 10, the Bible says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. We must recognize our sin, and then we must repent of our sin. The Bible says in Acts 17.30, And at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Can I say, throughout this psalm, David acknowledges his sin, and David is repenting of his sin. He is sorrowful for his sin. He says thou, in verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hard and, uh, hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Uh, 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 he says in verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Uh, can I say he repents of his sin? Now there's a lot of narrow-minded, pharisaical, so-called believers when you talk about David, all they're going to talk about is him defeating Goliath and talk about his great sin with Bathsheba. Amen. How that he's guilty of the murder of Uriah. They don't talk about Psalm 51. Amen. Psalm 51, David repents and gets right with God. And can I say this? As far as David being king, he goes on to do more for God after Psalm 51 than he did ever before Psalm 51. They don't talk about that. But Brother Ray, you know, make no mistake. David repented and got right with God, but he still had to pay. David buried four sons as a result of his sin. Yes, sir. The sword never left his house. But in all of that, David found comfort. He said, they cannot come to me, but I can go to where they are. Because David had gotten right with God. God wants us to recognize our sin. He wants us to repent from our sin. And then we are to rotate from our sin. Look at verse 13. We're to turn from it. 
David said, if you'll forgive me, God, this is what will happen, and this is what did happen. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's what happens when folks get saved. They want other people to get saved. When Christians get right with God, they want other folks to get right with God. Hmm? He said in verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. That's talking about the sin of Uriah. Uriah being murdered at David's hand. He's saying, Deliver me from that, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Did not David write those psalms praising God for what God had delivered him from? Why? Because God did deliver him from the blood guiltness. Uh, look at verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Uh, he goes on to uh, 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 say what happens when folks get right with God. Their life changes. They're no longer sinful. They're no longer sinners in the eyes of God. They're instruments that God uses uh, to point other sinners to him. Uh, uh, they're instruments that God uses uh, that once were contrary to God, uh, but now they worship God. Uh, now they praise God. Uh, now they exalt God. Uh, now they point others to God. That's what happens when folks get right with God. God never delivers somebody to keep them in their pit. David was in the pit till Psalm 51. Then he says, but he put me on a rock. Put praise of God in my mouth. huh? Hey, what happened? I met the Lord and he changed my life. There's an epidemic called sin. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I've got some good news. This epidemic of sin has more than an antidote. It has a cleansing. I don't have time to take you there, but if we went to 1 John chapter number 5, though once you were outside, though once you were a sinner, once you was wicked, once you was a transgressor before God, once you was the enemy of God, but God loved you. And God revealed himself unto you through the scriptures. And you realize Jesus died for you, was buried, rose again. And that Jesus would forgive you of your sins if you called on him, you repented and trusted in him. And you did that many years ago. But bad news is you've failed God since then. But God does a miraculous thing. In 1 John chapter 5, he says if you really repent, you no longer sin. Now, Brother Donald... This flesh sins every day. So how can I never sin? Because Brother John, when you got born again, he sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise, and he sealed your soul, and your soul before God is righteous and holy as if it had never sinned. Uh, my dear friends, uh, when God saves you, he does change you because what's inside now becomes pure and holy before God. Uh, and even though your flesh may fail him, uh, he's made provision that if we we'll confess our sins, uh, uh, that he's faithful and just to forgive us uh, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, but our soul will never sin again uh, because it's been washed by the blood of Jesus. Jesus. Say, why does this crowd get so excited? Because we once were sinners. But now we've been saved by the grace of God. And although we may trip up every now and then, there's provision where we can be clean before God. But this epidemic of sin will not stop until Jesus returns and sits on the throne of David. Can I help you tonight? This morning... If you're in your sin, there's a remedy. Amen. And his name is Jesus. Amen. But you'll never get any help till you're willing to confess your sin, repent of your sin, and trust the Lord to change you. And he will, friend, if you're willing to confess it and ask him to forgive you. And the Lord's a gentleman. 
See, this epidemic's going on. God's not going to step in and stop it because man chose to sin. Sin's going to run its course. Yes, sir. But God invites anyone affected by sin to come to him. Yeah. And if we'll come to him, he'll no wise cast us out. Yeah. And that's when he'll change us. Yeah. Now, if you happen to get corona, if you happen to get go on a cruise ship and thumb your nose at the preacher and show pictures of the hamburger joint on the cruise ship, you better hide back there, Kevin. Uh <laughs> He's got corona. It stunted his growth. He's had it from birth, huh? If you happen to get coronavirus or the flu or a bad case of the can't help it, and you're willing to moan and groan on your couch and live with it till you die, shame on you. We got a hospital in every part of our county, our community. We got doctors everywhere. There's urgent care everywhere. There's people who can give you a shot everywhere. You can get some relief from what is ailing you if you'll get off your couch and go get some help. But here's what amazes me. We get a runny nose, we'll run to the doctor. We'll get some help. But our lives are affected by sin and we won't come to Jesus and get it cleansed. Friend, you can have your sin cleansed today. But you got to do like David did. You've got to acknowledge that you've got a problem and confess to God. He's the only one that can show you mercy and cleanse you from your sin and repent and ask him to do it. If you're willing to do that, you'll get more than inoculated. You'll get changed forevermore. You get a better life here and then heaven after this is all over. That's a pretty good deal. All I got to bring to him, Brother Brian, was tattered garments by sin, and he gave me all of heaven. Friend, he'll give you heaven too. But you've got to confess your sinner and repent of your sins. Now listen. I don't mean to be unkind, but I'm going to do it. If you're sick, you've got to go to the doctor. The days of doctors making house calls are over unless you're a dog, a cow, or a pony. You've got to go to the doctor. Well, in a very rude and crude and obnoxious way today, let us all know we're sinners. If you've never been born again, the only way you're going to get born again, you've got to come to Jesus. Yeah. He's not going to come to you. You've got to come to him. He's already done the work, but you've got to come and acknowledge it. And it amazes me in churches, people got, preachers got to come up with all kinds of programs and plans to get you out of your seat to come to Jesus. Well, you're sick with sin. There is no cure. Sin is going to drag you off and take you to hell right. unless you get to Jesus. Right. Now, if you'll go get your runny nose fixed, why don't you get your sin problem fixed? Yeah. Right. Jesus has arms wide open. His loving kindness and tender mercy is available. Sure. But you've got to acknowledge you need Him. And when you're willing to get out of your seat and come to see Him, He'll save you, cleanse you, and change you forevermore. Yeah. But now the weight's on you. Amen. You've got to do business with Him. Say, I'll get saved when I want to. Oh, well, no, no, no. You'll get saved when he's dealing with you. Or you'll die and go to hell, friend. And right now he's dealing with you. Today's the accepted day. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the hour. Now's the time. Will you have your sin cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Say, preacher, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Wonderful. Are you clean? Is there anything affecting your fellowship with God? If so, get clean. Get it taken care of. Go out of here rejoicing. Don't leave out of here the same way you came in. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Let Jesus restore unto you the joy of his salvation. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. While they're coming, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the Bible. Lord, we love preaching on heaven. But Lord, you came, to save, came seeking to save that which was lost. God, you were indicted for being the friend of sinners and publicans. And God, you love sinners. It's your will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Lord, there are some here today. You're trying to reveal unto them their problem. Their problem is they're sinful. The problem is they've never met the Master. They've never confessed their sin and repented.
repented and trusted in Christ. Lord, I pray today that the sweet Holy Ghost would not be denied. I pray today would be their day. Lord, they do business with God. Come get right with the Lord. God, I pray for your people. <clears throat> Lord, we live in this world. Lord, sin tries to attach itself to us. God, I pray for any of your people. Lord, they're not where they should be. They'd come get cleansed. Leave out of here in the perfect will of God. God, have your way. Touch hearts. Save that one nearest tail. God, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.